We live in troubling times, political, cultural, and church fighting at every turn. We live in a society that is simply upside wrong, where what was once wrong is right, and what was once right is wrong. Where are the Lord's quality leaders? Where are our modern-day Nehemiahs? Do they exist? We need sound teachers who present accurate facts as they relate to Scripture, who are clear and free from meaningless cliches and relevant to our current events. You know, men and women like Nehemiah, our study, Hand Me My Sword, sets out to present realistic observations to present culture while evaluating how each applies to the eschatological truths contained in the Old and New Testaments. In the book of Nehemiah, the man who led God's people is presented in three roles. Early in the book, he is the cupbearer of the king, a servant. Midway through the story, he is a builder of the wall. In the third part of the book, he is governor of the city and surrounding sections of Jerusalem. He was a true and authentic leader of God. Hand Me My Sword is framed within the emphasis of using one hand to rebuild while keeping the sword of the Spirit in the other. We are praying that this mini-series blesses you beyond measure, so let's get started with our lesson for today. It is a blessed honor to have you join us for our episode for today. This is number 05, Nehemiah Rebuilds. Let's take a look at our overview for today. First of all, we must build walls around our lives to protect God's interests. Two, you cannot rebuild what you don't believe has fallen. Then we're going to go on and talk about neglecting your heart's condition leaves an open door for the enemy. Then having and releasing the heart of God releases you in your journey. We're going to spend time talking about discovering the marks of the competent leader within you. And of course, that's Jesus Christ himself. However, there is a condition with that one. If you do not have the life of Christ living in you, then this point becomes mute. Then we're going to go on and talk about bathing your rebuilding in prayer. So we got some exciting things coming up here. So let's take a look at the walls of our lives. God appears to reference the walls of our lives frequently in the Word. One of my cherished scriptures is in Isaiah, and it says this, Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Your builders hurry, your destroyers and devastators will depart from you. That's out of Isaiah chapter 49, verses 15 
through 17. Before we move on, let's contemplate just a little bit on this passage. First of all, God cares so much about our lives. He inscribes our names on the palms of his hands. He puts him, God the Father, as the primary parent figure in our lives. Secondly, he sees the walls of our lives just as important as the walls of Jerusalem. At this point in our study, we should understand how important it is to keep the walls of Jerusalem repaired and strong. In this, he sends Nehemiah to conduct his business of rebuilding the most important walls in the world. Bluntly speaking, the walls of our lives often lie in ruins through neglect, rebellion, and ignorance. Without question, the leader ordained in our lives is none other than the Holy Spirit through the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. The Spirit accomplishes the Lord's mission through the continuing work of reconstructing His protective walls from the inside out. The Spirit's first thing is to bring to our attention the condition of our walls. While most of us don't hear what He is saying, some are ignorant of hearing the voice of God from within, while others simply dig in deep and rebel. Let's review facing the facts. Most Christians today live in the walls of their lives surrounded by ruin. And it all began in a slow fade. Few are taught how to discern the voice of the Spirit from that of the self-life. Others are protesting the mandates of God in remaining secure within His boundaries. It all starts with a crack a particular sin or bitterness that began to rule one's life. After the daily abuse from life itself, the crack turns into a hole in the wall, which creates a perfect opportunity for the enemy to enter our lives. Satan sends one of his demons to gain access to create a spiritual stronghold. If further neglect becomes a norm for this believer, the weeds of carnal thinking begin to align with the enemy's thoughts and ideations. All are resulting in hearing the voice of the enemy over that of the indwelling spirit. Now, idolatry is formed. The enemy not only gains access into our life, but he is also assured of the believer hearing his voice, which many believers label, yep, the voice of God. It is in this that Satan assaults the living God, plus the believer begins living by demonic doctrines. You may be known for being a good Christian, this does not guarantee that you are one. People who follow Christian principles are not necessarily authentic believers who are indwelt by the life of Christ. These so-called believers are the ones who put Satan's words in God's mouth. Thus, why Jesus must spit them out of his mouth according to Revelation chapter 3. The parallel is simple. Most of the Jews during Nehemiah's leadership were pure bloodline Jews. However, few practiced Judaism. To make them authentic, obedient Jews, the two must join as one force. The same is true about Christianity. Believers must not only claim Christianity, but they must fulfill the second most important doctrine, be born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's review doing an inventory. Conduct an inventory in your true condition, including 
if you are authentically born again by and through Jesus Christ. Before Nehemiah started his rebuilding, he evaluated and did an inventory of the wall's condition. Many Christians tend to make light of the mandates of God. As our norm proves today, many hide behind the bush of grace. Paul once said, Should I sin that grace may abound? And then he went on to say, May it never be. Sad to say we live in a church culture where Paul's fear has become the norm. Today, grace is used as a license to tear down the walls of God while worshiping the gods of Babylon. When God, each hides behind the rationalization that we are all sinners and that I'm better than I used to be, If this is your mindset, the enemy is living in your camp. Your walls are down. Let's review reconstruction. Nehemiah's consistent concern and focus was reconstruction. However, he wasn't focused on self-strength, but rather the strength of the Lord through prayer. He prayed for guidance and correction of his pathway. As for me, busyness is the constant enemy of fulfilling the Lord's commission to pray always. If anyone can say there isn't enough time in the day to pray, well, it would be me. However, the older I get, the more dependent I have become on praying without ceasing. I have learned to request of the Lord's direction supernatural thoughts of Christ to be revealed in my frail mind and a clear direction on every project. Nehemiah was known for leading from the knees up. I too want to be known for the same practical application of quality leadership. I am alert to the reality of erosion is a constant battle within our souls of humanity. Little by little, bit by bit, we allow our enemy to enter holes in the walls of our lives, to one day mislead the bridal members of Christ to melt into the lukewarm community of believers. Without prayer and dependence on Jesus, erosion of the soul is simply inevitable. Neglect the heart or soul, a life of crumbled walls will soon be overrun by the world, our flesh, and the chaos our enemy has planned for us. Fact, don't just repent, rebuild. Many people repent on a normal, natural, and neutral basis, but that repentance is requiring a rebuilding within our lives. This is a step that many believers today simply ignore. Authentic repentance requires rebuilding. Preserving existing walls will assist you in the encouragement needed to conduct the hard work of rebuilding. Now let's look at living without the body of Christ. We need each other. Since God placed a measurement of spiritual gifts within all of his born-again believers, uniting those gifts as one force will ultimately create a workforce to rebuild the walls of the church itself. We all need to stop making excuses of the why we don't partner with other real-deal believers. It usually hides behind the erroneous ideology of not enjoying being told what to do. Independent Christians are either selfish believers or they aren't authentic Christians to start with. In our study, Nehemiah appealed not only to the Jewish leaders, but he empowered the Jews who were marginal. And he used the work ethic to accomplish this. The results 
The real deal Jews woke up. The marginal Jews were won over by the structure in which Nehemiah put in place through Ezra. In the end, a revival of sorts broke out, and Jerusalem was restored to the norm of God. Let's take a look at our primary principles in our study. Number one, walls. Maintain God's importance of walling up your life. Remember that story back in Job when Satan was appealing to God to destroy Job? After God responded to him, Satan again said, Well, I cannot reach him because of a hedge of protection that you have put about him. So what did God do? He dropped the hedge. The reason why this is a significant point is that Satan can't even get at us. God puts these walls around us, these hedges of protection, and then if he is able to get at us, we need to understand the sovereignty of God has allowed it. Number two, facts. Own up to the reality of your broken walls. Most Christians go through their day without taking a single moment to examine the walls that were around them now have holes within those walls. As I stated earlier, these holes in the walls are a result of the erosion of allowing the enemy to infiltrate our minds. Most of the time, we are the ones responsible for tearing down the walls that God built up to protect us. 3. Inventory Be willing to examine a self-examination for the condition of our souls. Paul himself even said that. He said, examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. There's a responsibility given to us that is oftentimes ignored, and that is self-examination. Number four, prayer. Reject independence. Rebuild from the knees up. This is such a critical point. In our next episode, we will devote the entire episode talking about the power that God releases through a dedicated commitment of communicating with Him. In conclusion, one of my favorite men of church history is A.W. Tozer, and he said these words, Every farmer knows the hunger of the wilderness, that hunger which no modern farm machinery, no improved agricultural methods can quite destroy. No matter how well prepared the soul, how well kept the fences, how carefully painted the buildings, let the owner neglect for a while his prized and valued acres, and they will revert again to the wilds and be swallowed up by the jungle or the wasteland. The bias of nature is toward the wilderness never toward the faithful field. His point is simple. Whatever is left to itself will return to the state upon which it was before redemption. And in his illustration, that would be those fields as lush and willing to produce fruit for the farmer if left unattended they will revert back to the same condition before the farmer began to till the land. Same is the case for us Christians, we will return to flesh on flesh. The Christian mind must be renewed daily, all day. When left to itself, self will dominate and rule. Yes, even an authentic born-again Christian can erode into a liberal and lukewarm mind. A mind that functions like an unsaved person. So what's the answer here? Release Christ's mind from within. You and I could never trust our own minds. 
It is self-governed, self-willed, and driven to be independent. Having Christ's mind in you is not a poetic expression. It is a fact. By learning to release his mind, your mind will fade into the dark corners of depravity, where it belongs. Coming up next, number 06, we're going to be talking about from the knees up. We'll explore how facing impossible circumstances through Christ. We're going to spend some specific time talking about the cupbearers have the heart of their master, not their own. We'll move on to talk about marks of a competent leader and follower. In that episode, we will be exploring Samuel's heirs of leadership. If you don't know much about Samuel and his sons, this will be an eye-opening reveal for you. The benefits of praying as you work is probably the most significant factor in a quality rebuild. Last but not least, we're going to be spending time in the practicals on how to clear your head while filling it with the Master's vision. The perfect description of covenant marriage is found in God's covenants for His people. In this particular episode, we'll explore some very fascinating details about the establishment of covenant marriage that God has implanted in His people. Nehemiah prayed covenantly. However, it was the Old Covenant. Furthermore, the meaning purpose description is found regarding marriage from Genesis to Revelation's book. I believe the ordained reason for creation, Old Covenant and the New Covenant, is to set the stage for Jesus becoming the groom of the bridal members of himself. Folks, that's called the body of Christ, which, by the way, is only the true born again and dwell believers. Therefore, I hope that you will join us in our next episode, focusing on prayer, building from the knees up, and the overwhelming power of Christ that is released within believers as they have an intimate and dependent relationship with Jesus himself. Until next time.